sometimes the direction you get from either the actor or if you're working with a department head for a show that's and you're coming in as a day player or as a specialist or you're working with producers and directors they all have a vision what you have to do is you have to figure out what's the best way to navigate through all these people and come up with a vision that they can all accept that works for everyone and that's sometimes a fine line to walk because it's not as easy as you think <laughs> sometimes you're dealing with five people that you have to please and you still want to be creative so it's getting that information pooling it together and then sitting down when you get an opportunity to sit down with everybody at a table then starting the design process you get somebody that really is good at sketching designs or can do computer generated designs now and then you go back and you show them those and you go is this what you want you may go through the process several times before you even get to a point we actually have a sculpted piece that's going to go through the mold making process for special makeup effects. Wounds, it's really dependent upon what the writer has put in the script and whether or not the producers and the director uh, agree with what the writer has put in and whether or not they feel that it's too much or not enough. In television, the writer is very powerful. So the writer oversees a lot of things that happen in the script. It's a little bit different than feature film. In feature film, the producers and the directors have a little bit more input into character development. And then, depending on whether the actor has a lot of power, like Johnny Depp is a very um, influential actor, and at this point in his career, he's able to help develop the character. He says, that's not going to work for me. And he gets to be part of that process. Early on, um, if the actor doesn't have as much, uh, let's say, potential and authority, they pretty much have to go with whatever the producers and the director and the writer say that that's, that character is going to evolve as. It is a process where everybody's involved, but at different levels on the chain of command. And really, the makeup artist falls probably just before the actor <laughs> and under everybody else. And it's okay because you have to have a chain of command in order to get to that final result, that product that the people see on the screen and is either effective or ineffective. And that is what Richard Corson taught me, is that there is no such thing as a right or wrong makeup, only effective or ineffective. It has to be effective for what it is called for in the script and what the character's needs are. So you can have a drunkard that is homeless, and it's going to have a very different look than, say, someone that is um, an alcoholic but lives the high life and, and has all this money. Their character may have some similarities, but their environment is also going to weigh heavily on who they are. So you have to take a look at all those variables. It's very important to understand that when you do character development as the makeup artist. What you don't want to do is put yourself in a position where you said yes to too many people, too many things at the same time, and then you ultimately you let someone down. If you have someone that thinks they already know it, and they know it all, you're not going to teach them anything. And so if you're that way, people will eventually clue into that, and they will go, we don't want to hire this person. First of all, they don't take direction well. Secondly, they think they're the best that there is, and they're not. <laughs> and a third, they don't complete what they start because they take, they take on way too much. And then they get overwhelmed by it, and they drop the ball. I've learned that the best thing I can do is tell someone, this is what I'm capable of. And if you want me to do more, I will endeavor to do that for you, but I will need assistance. And then I go get the assistance I need. And at this point, I can pick up the union book, and I can call people that I know, and I can find the resources available that are out there so that I do not put somebody in a compromising position on set the day of shooting 
or prior to that. You've got to be realistic about this. If you didn't learn early on, then you're going to learn somewhere in the middle of your career and it's going to be a painful experience. <laughs> and you're going to go, what the hell was I thinking? Why did I say yes to this? And the deadline is in 40 minutes and you're not ready. I had a, an issue where this happened on My Name is Earl. We had to do ball caps on two gentlemen for their characters. It was a very hot day in February and it was sunny. They had them standing out in direct sunlight with bald caps on, sweating profusely. 75 to 80 percent of the heat of your body can escape from your head. So they're already standing in the sun. Their head is covered with a bald cap. They're already dripping where they can drip. And the bald cap starts to separate and peel. And the, the um, first AD says to me, what can you do about that? Because you could see it was slipping, and they'd already done the wide shots, and now they wanted to do close-ups instead of doing it the other way around. And I warned them early in the day, do the close-ups first. They didn't listen. So I said, I looked at it, and I said, oh, pretty much about nothing. Because you've got that sweat and that glue along that line, and the ball cap is glued back here too. So it's stretched onto the head, and it wants to recede back. <laughs> and I went back to the... Uh, department head of makeup, Peggy, and I went to the first AD and I said, as soon as you get this shot before lunch, you get the trailer cranked up as cold as you can get that makeup trailer. We'll rush them back, we'll lance it open, which I'd never done before. I was like, I have no idea if this is going to work, but I will give it a try. We'll lance it open from the front, we'll go inside, we'll swab it all down, clean it up with alcohol, and cool him off too, because he's hot, so it's not going to stick if he's sweating. And we'll try and put it back down and seam the edges, and hopefully it'll look good for close-ups after lunch. That took me with the gentleman, um, Mike Mosier, is a good friend of mine, also a very good makeup effects artist. That took us half an hour before lunch, the two of us opened that up, the sweat just ran down the actor's face. It just dumped out. And we wipe him up. We clean him up as fast as we can. We're cleaning and drying. we got a blow dryer drying the inside of the ball cap, trying not to stretch it. And then we carefully start gluing again and laying it down and trying not to get creases and wrinkles all along the way and get it back in place and then seam the edges with what we call Bondo. It's not car Bondo, but we call it Bondo. And then we have to repaint it, airbrush it, and spatter makeup on it. I've had actors go into their trailer after I've done makeup on them, come back, and I go, what did you do? Were you, did you, in between, did you go on a wrestling match or something? Because you, I've got to redo half of this. And then you've got to try and convince production that you need that additional time to freshen that makeup. It's hard enough when you're just doing beauty makeup and you've got a long day and the actress um, wants to take a nap and she's got eyelashes on and she's got airbrushed beauty makeup or she's had, um, say, uh, a greasy meal or a guy has had a greasy meal. It's hard enough to just freshen regular makeup up. But when you have to take a prosthetic makeup and you have to make it look fresh again, it's a lot more tedious. So if you make them aware of this from the beginning, you've done your job. If they decide they're going to hold off and let that actor sit around for 10 hours without doing the close-ups first, then you're going to do the best you can in holding it together. And you're going to hope nowadays that digitally they'll go in and repair what you can't. Because there becomes uh, a point of no return <laughs> on makeups. It's like, I can't really fix that the way it looked like at uh, 6 this morning. I can't. I can do the best I possibly can, but I can't. When they don't listen to you, they almost invariably come back to you and go, what's wrong? It's falling apart. It's makeup. It's not supposed to be on the face in the first place. <laughs>